for last Friday. So we are going to have a popular service on um, Tuesday, last of all, I call it. And also we provide the lunch on? Yes. Thank you, Sharon. And if any members could donate to that, um, that would be very helpful. Yes, After yes. service today, um, I'm moving to be able to share down the chairs downstairs set up. So if anyone would want us, please come help set up chairs and tables. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. We will have a very um, from two to four and six to eight at Eckhart, you know, all the way. So um, please come and visit there and um, share your comfort and encouragement with your family. So, okay, so we're going to hurry up. Like, we're going to wash it a little bit. So, let us pray. Gracious and merciful Lord, Lord, we thank you so much for helping us to be here together, to listen to, to your word. Help us to open our hearts and minds so that we can fully hear your gentle voice and your guidance in our life. Today we want to listen to your word. Help us to have deep insight and profound lessons from the lessons. Let us make faithful decisions for your kingdom in our lives as well. Pour out your love and care so that your people may know who you are. You are our God and your love never changes. So Lord, we thank God, our church members and our friends name before your Lord. We pray for well, for his recovery and also his transition as our Lord. He has been such a great Church members, Lord, you provide your care and help. And we pray for Hank for his surgery, surgery and recovery as well. And we also pray for Brian Bill's family, provide your care and heavenly peace and comfort to those who lost their loved ones. Lord, we are here to worship you and we are here to listen to you, Lord, be your blessed God. Thank you, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. So as we begin our service, we sing our vocal prayer together for you. You can find the song in our
The Lord calls us today to be people of justice and mercy. Our worship is The Lord asks that our words of hope become the actions of peace. We seek our challenges and calls us. That our ministry together brings peace and justice. Let our lives reflect God's love and mercy. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for calling to us this day. We praise you that you challenge us to show our faith in ministries of peace and justice, offering compassion to all in need. Open our hearts and minds to, to hear your words of encouragement and challenge. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread. As we forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we stop the temptation, deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory. Blessings and love next to you, Lord. Take our heart and thanksgiving for you and pour out more blessings upon your people so that you all know your love and your love over the all the time. We pray in your name. Amen. Please be seated.
they stand for the gospel. We Mark 8, verses 34 Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <laughs> So, as I mentioned before today, we will have a little bit different format. Um, our worship service today is a little different than our normal service. Today, we resume our Bible one on one session, and which was we planned with two years ago. So, due to the pandemic, um, we had to postpone um, over and over again. So, today is the official day that we begin our Bible one on one plan. And it uh, basically covers the Bible 101. So I hope you have some great insights um, in this time. And I'm warning you, this is a little bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is very insightful. So I hope not just enjoy the sermon, but then um, you'll find some important message for our um, time. Today. So, the, basically, the question that we bring today is that we have how many gospels do we have? We have four gospels. And then I'm wondering, like, if the four gospels just talk about the goodness, gospel means goodness, right? If the four gospels simply talk about the basic one message, why do we have four different gospels? So this is the question. Do I just read one gospel four times? <laughs> or or uh, do they have some quaint, like different direction of the gospel? This is my question. So today I'm going to explain the reason why we have four different gospels in the New Testament and why knowing the difference between the four gospels is important. I think this is the main point that we want to show. So, first of all, take a look at this. The four Gospels basically talk about the goodness. Gospel means goodness, right? The Gospel also means that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. saved. This is the main Gospel that we know. From John chapter 3.16, we all know this, right? Whoever believes in the name of the Jesus Christ will be saved. This is one main gospel. And the second pillar is that Luke, it's from Luke chapter 10, 27. Love your God and your neighbor as yourself. So these are two major pillars, major pillar, main, main teachings uh, of the four gospels. So the four gospels teach about what gospel means and how the people of God should live in this world. This is the core message of gospel. So when you read Matthew chapter 22, 37 to 8, I'm sorry for, you know, you cannot do this now. Uh, PowerPoint this morning. So Matthew chapter 22, 37 to 8, 
it talks about the same thing love God and love your neighbor to yourself. And Mark chapter 12, 30, love your Lord and your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And also Luke chapter 10, 27. So that's the basically the same thing. So these are the same passages. The question is, why do we need different four gospel in the New Testament? So even if, so the point is this, even if the four gospel shares basically one simple story, the story of Jesus' ministry, but they also have different things. They're not the same. They are different. For example, Mark does not have stories about Jesus' birth. Mark does not have that kind of stories. But then compared to Mark, Luke and Matthew, they have some stories about Jesus' birth. And then we still see the differences as well. Matthew talks about Jesus is the baby king, so Magi tried to visit and try to find a new king. That's Matthew's perspective. Jesus is the king. But then Luke, who was the first visitor in birth? Do you remember that? The shepherd, the lower class people, was the first visitor to see Jesus. So can you see the differences a little bit? So it's the different tone of the Bible. So what the four Gospels look like, that is our question. So do you remember the legendary printed picture of Apple when Steve Jobs introduced his first revolutionary device, iPhone, to the public? Do you remember that? Show me your phone. Mm -hmm. Show me your phone. What do you have? Apple. Android. <laughs> Anybody have Android? So, this is the analogy that I want you to remember. So let me just come up. So I have my previous iPhone here. The first gen and second gen, the newest one. So that's um okay. So that's new one. So we have seen the series of Apple, the three Apple, and Android, you got it. Stand, stand, please, stand. <laughs> so, Wendy and I, we are sharing um, Apple. So, you have Android, but they are phones. So, this is the concept. First, the three gospel gospel Matthew, Mark, Luke, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> they have they share the same stuff and a little bit different perspective. They share the same thing. But John, you are John. <laughs> John, the tone of John, the gospel of John talks about something different. So I want you to remember when we think about the four different gospels, the first three are the same. So we call it synoptic gospel, which means the three have the same story, share the same story. But then the fourth one, Gospel John, is a different story. So these are, this is the analogy that I wanted you to remember. The three, first the three Gospels are the same idea and the same understanding, but John is different. So, now since I'm checking the time, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, bother you too much, so let me skip some parts of our conversation today. And if you need more information, then maybe that will. Um, so today we are going to cover Gospel of Mark, not Matthew. You know the first three uh, Gospels. The order is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? But we are going to cover Mark first which means Mark was the first gospel that was written in the earliest date. So I say Gospel of Mark, which is a very short gospel, which covers only 16 chapters, compared to Gospel of Matthew 28, Gospel of Luke 24. So Gospel of Mark it has some you know, shorter 
chapters and short story. So that's why we, we believe that Gospel Mark was the original text that was written first. That's the consensus of the scholars of the New Testament. So make a long story short, the first original gospel is Mark. The second book, the first original gospel is Mark. I'm going to explain why it is very important. There are many important reasons why scholars say the Mark is the first book. The storyline is very simple compared to other books. And it mainly talks about actual teachings of Jesus Christ and actually his words and the short um, miracle stories. And Jesus was the miracle maker in based on the Gospel of Mark. And then again, the four lengths of the chapter is shorter than other gospel. So we believe that Matthew and Luke added a little bit more stories later based on their need. So we know that Gospel of Mark, which is simple and very clear, this was the original message of the good news. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper about Gospel of Mark today. So Gospel of Mark is the first book was written as the, gospel, the book of Gospel. But it was so unfortunate to have it. You should listen to this carefully. I say it is, it was unfortunate to have this book. This is the claim that I want to show. Like the previous story of background, that's a consensus, everybody knows that, and every scholar talks about that, the same thing. But then this is the claim today, is my claim. It was unfortunate to have this book in the first century. You heard right? This book was not supposed to be written. This book was not supposed to be written. So let me briefly explain the context of Jesus' movement that you know. So as you know, after Jesus ascended to heaven, and then the followers of Jesus Christ, they received the Holy Spirit. And what happened in Acts 2? Do you remember that what happened? When they received the Holy Spirit, they spoke, spoke in tongues. Basically, they spoke different languages. And why? I repeated this several times ago, right? Why should they speak in different languages? Because the words of God should be delivered to other countries and to other people. The, the message should be delivered to other towns. So that's why the first disciples, they spoke in different languages so that other people can listen to the good news. So after that, in the first century for several decades, the first missionaries, I call them first missionaries, first missionaries delivered the gospel everywhere. They were hidden disciples, and faithful witnesses with no name, and many church communities were built, and even urban cities in the Roman Empire. They established the church community. They delivered the goodness to the people. And the Gospel of Mark later, about one generation later, we assume that AD 70s, like 40 years later after Jesus died, so Gospel Mark was written for the Christian community in Rome. So isn't it strange to know that the Gospel was written for the Christian community in Rome, not in Jerusalem or not in uh, the, the land of uh, Israelites. So this Gospel was written for the Christian community in Rome. That's why the Gospel of Mark and other Gospels were written in common, common Greek. So that's why the message was written in Greek, the official language of the Roman Empire. And then 
I'm going to briefly talk about the reason why I say this is unfortunate. So first of all, in Rome, when Gospel of Mark was written, the empire persecuted Christians. But this is a strange thing. That's not because they serve the only God who called it monotheism, like just one serving one God. This is a different, radically different concept that Roman people had. But that's not because these people serve the only God, the different God than what Roman people believed. Here are some interesting stories. In Rome and many other metropolitan Roman cities, people respected the Jewish faith. People respected Jewish people and their faith and their culture. That's why in every city, Jewish immigrants established their own communities and could build synagogues everywhere they went. So based on the Roman Empire, they respected Jewish culture, but the Christians were different. Roman Empire did not like the small cult, and so people, and also Roman people misunderstood the Christian language and teaching, such as agape, and eating the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ, eating the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ, they misunderstood that. So Roman culture did not like did not like Christian manners and attitude. And then the worst part was that Christians were not afraid of calling their Savior Jesus Christ is the King, the Lord. The term, the Lord, Beatles in Greek, was the only title that Roman people used to call the living God, Roman emperors. So Christian, they dearly called Jesus Christ the Lord, but the Roman Empire did not like that. Due to this disrespect and blasphemy from the Roman perspective, they persecuted Christians. The second of all, there was a generational issues. After they created a Christian community wherever they went, the persecution was getting worse and became harder to endure. So many Christian leaders died, and the, the first generation Christian, they were aging. But the second generation Christian did not have the same faith. Since they did not have enough resource, so they learned about Christian and about Christian faith and about the Savior Jesus Christ based on the narrative, based on the explanations of their parents and the church leaders who used to live with Jesus and ate with Jesus, they actually taught the real story to the first generation. But then the second generation, after the 40 years of the first generation, they did not have enough resources to know who Jesus exactly was. And then most, most of all, this challenge became a real threat to the Christian community because the second generation did not understand why their parents had to be killed due to their faith in Christ. They couldn't understand why their parents was killed. And why the living Christ would not help when their first generation were killed due to their faith. They could not understand. So they asked the same question. Why is, when, what is he doing right now? When my dad and my mother was killed. As looking at their previous generation was killed, they just brought some doubt and questions of their faith. And then the third, the most important reason. The most important reason is the theological crisis as well. So you can imagine the crisis of the second generation that I just mentioned, you mentioned, you understand that part, right? So the first generation had tangible faith in Christ, but the second generation was not. And this is just a part of the tiny theological crisis of the Christian community in Rome. However, there was a more essential reason 
they believed that Christ went to heaven and he promised he will come back soon. So you heard right. They expected Christ, the reason Christ ascended to heaven, come back soon. That was the promise that they believed. This was the main key confession of the Holy Church community. So everybody in the Holy Church community, they believe that Jesus will come back soon. This is called parousia. Have you heard of the term parousia? So parousia basically means parousia, two different terms. Para means completeness, and usia means essence. The real one, the genuine one, will come. This is a concept of parousia. So we call it second coming of Jesus Christ. So they expect that Jesus will come back soon. So this is my cousin Charlie. So based upon this foundation, like the Christians in the uh, the Christian community in Rome, they had a very clear understanding about Jesus. But then they do not have much resources. They know that Jesus will come soon. That is that was the core confession of faith of the community. So, do you think they needed the Bible? They needed the New Testament gospel. <laughs> yeah, they needed the message, right? They needed the gospel. But then this is another question: Do they? Do they? I mean, did they need the written passage? Because they know that Jesus will come soon and this will be over. So they don't need any, any resource because their faith was so clear. Jesus is my Savior. He will come back soon. So we have no tomorrow. We have no tomorrow. So upon this understanding, we can say that they did not need any resource because Jesus will come soon, and then this is this will be the last chapter of the whole story of the salvation. They just believe in Jesus. Jesus is the Lord, and believe that Jesus will come back soon, and Jesus saved them from the evil reality. The Roman Empire, Jesus will save them soon, and it is very clear. So what happened? Jesus did not come. Jesus did not come back. And the emotional, social, religious, and theological concerns of the second generation became real threats at this point. That's why they needed to describe who Jesus was and what he had taught to the first generation. They need to figure out the true message. This is the context of the mark why the Gospel of Mark was written in Rome for the Christian community. So this is the main thing. Why does Mark say about Jesus and his message? If we do understand, if we understand this context very well, we should know that why Mark's message is, the, is so important. Because we know that this is the original Gospel. This is about original confession of the only church Christians. More original than the Gospel of Matthew, more original than the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Mark, and what it says, is the more important and more original and genuine message that we can remember. So basically, Mark talks about two things. First of all, Jesus is a miracle maker. If we read Mark carefully, then you see a lot of miracle stories. About the half of the stories of Mark talks about Jesus' miracle. So can you understand why it's so important? They needed this type of stories to remind them Jesus was a miracle maker. And he would do the same thing for those who faithfully follow and who were not afraid of any harsh persecution. Currently happening 
Jesus is the miracle maker, and he will do the same thing to us. That is the core message of the mark, the first part. And second of all, the second is about suffering Christ. Jesus was suffering. The half of the mark talks about Jesus. I mean, Jesus, he mentioned several times, I will die. I will be here to save you. This is the one of the um, key words that you can find in the Gospel of Mark. I need a long time to discuss this part about Christology, but now to make a very clear point, I want you to remember this. In the Jewish context, it's a little bit different than we think today. In Jewish context, Jewish people had many Christs and the saviors, and Jews did not care about how many Christ can be saviors they had because they truly believe that the time will prove later if the person was the Christ or not. So they did not care about people saying that, yo, oh, this is a Christ, this is a savior. They did not care about that. Because they know that the time will prove it later if the person was the Messiah or not. But the concept of this Christian community, suffering and the Messiah, suffering and the Christ, the two things do not match. However, Mark courageously proclaimed that the one who took the cross and obey God's will until he died on the cross was the Messiah. The suffering one became the Messiah. That is the faith we can find in the gospel of God. Not abandoned one by God, or not cursed one by God, but this suffering Christ became the Savior. They thought of So again, to think about the Roman Christian. They did not know why they should go through those harsh persecution and painful process to believe God and Jesus Christ. And they asked why Jesus did not or has not done anything for them. The Gospel of Mark claims that since Jesus also received the same suffering and pain, he knows our since Jesus knows the pain of the people, he is with us. And Jesus teaches us through this message. You, even though you are in pain, you are not. So I'm going to wrap up my message at this point. Many churches even today, repeat it is moral. Go back to the original gospel message. Then my question is this, what does it mean? What does it mean, original message, original gospel to you? Do we even need this? And people say that I have my, my own way to serve God. I have my own style to be a Christian. But then our question is that, how can you say that? How do you know you are and you have Christian foundation without knowing the original gospel message of Mark? The original message from Mark teaches about God and Christ basically two things. As I mentioned before, first of all, Jesus is the miracle maker. Do you believe? Jesus is the miracle maker. This is the original gospel. Jesus is the miracle maker. Do you believe that? And second of all, Jesus also suffered. He took the pain of the people and he did not refuse to take the suffering of the people and he died on the cross. This is the important message of Mark. If you are still in pain, if you still mourn, if you still have some issues with life, 
and there is no friend to share your suffering, then look at Jesus who died on the cross. He knows your pain and you're not alone. But Jesus promised that he is always with his people. So we are living in a world that does not ask us for any challenges due to our faith, then how does the original gospel come to you? How does the original message? You are not alone. The suffering Christ will know your pain and he will be your friend. How does this message tell you about your life and what did you do? Faith with no pressure to make. No pressure. Faith with no pressure and no commitment and no decision and no mission. And people say it's still okay. This is the manner that our world teaches us today. However, to the suffering people, suffering first generation Christian community wrong. And for those who had to sacrifice everything due to their faith, this fact was so important. This is the good news. Jesus died to save God's people, and Jesus showed so many miracles so that people can believe in Jesus Christ and follow the way of God, personally not fully. Even under serious persecution, the people of God could follow the way. To the people in despair and suffering, Jesus said, my child, you are not alone. So do you believe this message? Do you believe this message? Jesus is speaking to you. You are not alone. So think about this. Watch what is your God? What is your understanding? Is your faith serious enough? And is your gospel message important to your life? And what did you do to share? If you think your message is precious, what would you do to share this precious lesson with your people? Amen. Mark, is Mark, is it coming up? Please join me in um, prayer of confession that we can find in our church bulletin. Please join me in prayer of confession. Let us pray. We did it by hand. We know how easy it is. First, to celebrate the joy. We praise the wonderful Lord to the present joy. Our music soars to the heavens. And how long we have been our existence? We ask us to be ready to serve you at that time. We place our opinions on this. We put it 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 on this.
On the night in which he did make himself a poor, he took a bread and he gave thanks to you. And broke the bread and gave to you his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in the bread. When the supper was over, Jesus took a cup, and Jesus gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, for you for you and for many for you for you six things. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. Amen. Let's pray together. Pour out your Holy Spirit and us gathered here, and on this evening of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world and the body of Christ, within by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in Father and Father. And we feast at his heavenly death, through your Son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. For honor and glory to you, for my Father, now and forever. Amen. Because there is, there is one loaf of bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup that we share this morning, which we gave thanks, is assuring in the blood of Christ. Amen. Now we are going to share our communion portions. Please help uh, to make a line.
Remember, sisters and brothers in Christ, we know good news. It is all about Jesus and we confess Jesus is our Savior. So, do you truly believe it? And also remember the core message of Gospel of Mark. Jesus is the miracle maker. He will show the same thing. Even if we are in despair, we are in trouble, and we have no hope. He will help us. The suffering Christ will be with us because he knows our pain. So lean on Christ and pray to him. Then he will help you. May the grace of the Son Jesus Christ and love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. Thank you all for staying back for the to listen to my presentation. Um, I originally wanted to present this in December of last year, but it didn't really work out. But I'm glad that I'm able to do this um, today. My final report for my project was approved in August of last year. And this past June was the Gold, Gold Award Gala that I was unable to attend since we were out of the country. But once we got back, I was able to put that in certificate and act. So today I'll be going over the root cause of my project, my target audience, and my project goals. I'll be sharing my results and pictures, and I'll be discussing the sustainment of my project as well as its national and global work. My project was directed toward the issue of homelessness, and the root cause has two parts. The first part is that the homeless are financially unstable, which could be because, could be because of losing their job, their status after a divorce, being kicked out of their home or being veterans without a home to go to after leaving the military. It is the inability to support themselves and or their family, especially before during the pandemic. A lot of people lost their jobs and weren't getting paid, so they didn't have enough money to support themselves for their necessities or even have a roof over their heads. All this can make these people feel hopeless and devastated, which could then later lead to depression. The second part is the problem of people being un uneducated about homelessness. This can occur because there's no outlet to get the information about it, and this is probably one of the most common reasons. Or they may, may not want to listen about it or don't care about the issue altogether. And then my target audience was basically anyone, young children, teens, and adults of any age. I had four major project goals that I wanted to reach throughout the process of my project. I wanted to educate youth, friends, and younger scouts about homelessness make at least 100 pair of bracelets, reinforce the meaning of what the bracelet symbolizes, and motivate other, others to reach out in the community. For my results, I addressed the educational portion of my project by meeting and educating other girls' countries in my community, and by creating a seven to eight minute educational video that will be presented at my former school, Liberty High School, during health class, more specifically during their mental health unit. I've contacted and sent my video to Liberty South teacher, Mr. Davis, and he was more than willing to share with his incoming classes. I addressed the emotional part of my issue, which targeted depression by created, creating paracord bracelets that stand as a reminder that those in need are color. Each color, red, blue, yellow, green, and purple, has its own unique meaning, which motivates the ones in need that they can get in hard times. I made bracelets for both children and adults. And attach messages to them, which is a physical reminder to them whenever they wear the bracelet. This connection is important because they will feel that, feel that there is someone who cares about them. The different colored signs that I made are also reminders for those who go to Shepherd Staff for help and also for the surrounding community. Shepherd Staff is an organization that um, our church has been to to before, um, and it's in Westminster that needs those in need. Um, for the colors, red stood for love, green for hope we for never giving up, yellow for joy, and purple for bravery. And they're the same colors that I used for the bracelets and the messages encompass the same meanings on the sides. I made 233 total bracelets, 120 for adults and 113 for children, 20 keychains and five yard signs. I also collected a handful of hygiene items and perishable gifts for Shepherd staff as well. So now for the fun part, um, I get to share some pictures from the process of my project. My project proposal was approved by Girl Scouts of Central Maryland in December of 2020. I then took my project ideas and initially discussed them with um, Mr. Lamas Tehran over Zoom, since my idea to support server staff was actually sparked by a phone call that I had with Ms. Julie a while back when I was trying to figure out what to do with my project. Um, after that, I took my ideas further and discussed them with the church council. Um, after that, I had to reach out to a lot of people to get my project going. I wrote announcements in the church bulletin and reached out to other Girl Scout troops. After getting donations, I was able to order the materials needed. I then started to work on assembling the paracord kits. I measured the paracord, made instructions, and made a video as well about how to assemble the bracelets. I then distributed them at church. 
Um, I place collection bins for the brace of kits and for item donations as well for Shepherd staff. I then coordinated Zoom meetings with two younger uh, troops who helped me and presented them with my educational PowerPoint about homelessness. Back to making the bracelets, once the motivational messages were complete, I then had to help in the preschool with my mitigated parts. I got a lot of help from Girl Scout Senior Troop 5228. I met with them twice since they really enjoyed making bracelets the first time we got together. Although, all together they made, um, they helped me make 35 bracelets and a 20 key chains. They also helped me write some of the motivational messages. I also met with Girl Scout Cadet Troop 1020. I educated them about the issue, spoke about the Gold Award, and taught them how to make the bracelets and how it would benefit the community. They helped me make 20 bracelets. I also met with the church youth group, and they helped me make about 15 bracelets. After gathering all the bracelets from the two troops, youth group, and bracelet kits, I cut off the access length of paracord and cinched the ends. Then after that, I tied the messages onto the bracelets with corresponding colored ribbons. I came up with the idea of making yard signs about halfway through my process. Um, I wanted to make something that's a visual reminder of the Shepherd Staff House. I took trips to Home Depot to buy more materials, and then I got to making the signs. I had to cut, file, and plant the wood. And I also measured, painted, and sealed the beach signs. This sort of sounds like <laughs> um, after everything was finished, I delivered the donations, bracelets, and signs. I picked out specific places around the Shepherd Staff House to put the yard signs so that they could easily be seen by the surrounding community. An important part of completing a gold work project is its sustainment. I achieved sustainment in my project by creating a motivational ties bin. Um, it's right here with more materials to make bracelets. This bin will be placed in the youth group room so that the Sunday school and youth group continue to make bracelets for Shepherd staff, but also for other organizations in the community that targets the homeless. The educational part is sustained by my former high school co-teacher, Mr. Davis. He will share my educational presentation with his classes during the mental health units. Since every high school student is required to take one health class to graduate, I know that every new incoming student at Liberty We'll see my presentation. The yard signs are the third sustainment point of my project since they will continue to stay place where I put them. Within my presentation, I connected my issue to what is seen nationally and globally. Homelessness exists, exists everywhere, and as population size increases, it's seen even more how homelessness affects those around us. Spreading the idea of motivation really links the idea of my project to the ones in me. We consist of many communities that can work together to help make the lives of those in need less stressful. Mental health is another issue that is seen worldwide and strongly connects to homelessness. The more people who are educated about it, then the want to help will also increase. Um, so I would like to sincerely thank everyone for supporting me with my project. Um, I would like to thank the church congregation for your generous donations, as well as your help with making bracelets. I really couldn't have accomplished this without you. And I couldn't have experienced all my other scouting accomplishments without all of you as well. <laughs> Your support throughout my Girl Scout year means so much to me. And I thank you all for that. Um, for my project, I would also like to thank the preschool for allowing me to use the one machine. I'd also like to thank Ms. Clary for getting my messages sent to the bulletins. I would also like to thank Ms. Julie, Mr. Rod, Ms. Laura, and the youth group for their help. Um, I would like to thank the Girl Scout troops to help me as well. And <laughs> <laughs> I should not have put that on. <laughs> I would also like to thank Ms. Rao for connecting 
from Shepherd's staff and even though she couldn't have come today, um, I'm very appreciative, appreciative of her help and the information that she provided me with throughout my project. Um, so at this time, I would like to call my troop leader, Ms. Lurie, to the front. Uh, Ms. Lurie has been my troop leader since I think I was in second grade. Um, she's done many things to my troop throughout the years, and even though our troop dwindled down to only two girls, um, she put in the time and effort to still make Scott enjoyable. Um, Ms. Lurie is a Girl Scout alum, so I would like to give her this alum pin as well as the full board mentor. Say a few words too, and it's like I set me off already. So, <laughs> um, I have had the pleasure of being to call your scout almost since the beginning. <laughs> Um, if you can think back way back to 2005 and see some of the faces, we moved here from Richmond. And we got up for one of the families who welcomed us. Um, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously very personal for us. Um, we're neighbors. Um, I, I remember I took me down the one question to go back to remember Gabriella when we were walking from the bus stop one of our first days of school. And to listen and how to catch the bus the right spot and know where everything was. And Liliana asked, Korea, do you like to be in the Girl Scout troop? <laughs> the rest is history. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to watch you grow, both by year old, all the way up to school women making a difference. Leading, um, leading the service, um, it's just very impressive. And I just wanted to um, share a couple little stories over the years. Another little change in 2009, my glasses. Um, memories of my memories, totally intertwined with um, scouting and the community. Um, the first, first on um, bridging in your family room, walking up the wooden bridge. Um, as juniors, um, camping for the first time. It happened because the tornado came Friday and Saturday morning while we got the stomach bug. <laughs> That didn't happen. Um, working downtown Main Street, Banji endless flowers, watering gallons and gallons near Main Street. Um, I gotta read my notes here. Rocking the ball, right? Over almost 200,000 Girl Scouts this year, right? In 100 degree weather. That would be a memory maker for sure. Um, let's see. Cookies. How do we get the cookies? And all of you, I'm sure most of you this group had bought for our troops, and thank you. So allow them to, um, to do projects such as this. Um, helping Alice's troop, um, leading them, showing them how to be leaders and how to learn their skills. Uh, let's see, what else have we done? Oh, walking the streets of Savannah. <laughs> walking the footsteps of all the Girl Scouts before us. COVID coming up with projects with all the obstacles and restrictions of Girl Scouts. I'm super, super proud of you. I'm so blessed to have been part of it. I don't see this as an ending though. You took a tremendous job with your projects. I know you're going to do things. You can continue. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Long weighted gold pin. Not many girls wear this. Women, excuse me. And it's very um, appropriate that this is the 110th um, year of Girl Scouting. So thanks for waiting an extra year. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I would like to close just by thanking my family and close friends for always 
being there for me and trusting me that accomplish things, you know, even if they seem to be stressful or challenging. Um, with their support, I was able to believe in myself, and that's something that's very important to have when doing a project like this or really anything that involves being with your group. Thank you all very much. <laughs> yes, you do. So I just want to speak uh, as a brother, as uh, there's so much I want to say with sort of the words. Uh, first of all, I can't, I can't express how appreciative uh, we are and how appreciative I am as well on how much this congregation, this community of people, this family uh, have, has supported us and has allowed us people like Louie and I and the people here to grow as individuals and grow as people, as leaders, um, as ambassadors to other people in the public community. So thank you all for allowing us to do that. Um, also want to speak uh, as a brother, um, since I can remember, since I started my journey as well, Lily was always there whenever we were doing things. She was always like, oh, I want to go do stuff. She's always really excited. Um, I was a boy scout. She was a boy scout. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are pictures. There are pictures from when I was in Coast Guard and Coast Guard. She's somewhere way around, you know, she's, she's with us. Um, and I can't express how happy I was looking back on like how, how happy I was that I could enjoy those moments with my sister, with my friends, and with my family. Um, and, you know, as we got older, people, people get busy. Like, we started to move parts of life that we started getting introduced to parts of life. We started there's a lot of responsibility that comes with being part of the community, um, just thrown over in general. And sometimes I feel like that is kind of uh, the way it things. Um, I'm two years older than me, so I started to work earlier, and I was out of the house also earlier too. And while she was doing her band, I wish I was there as much as she was there for me and how much my family was there for me. But I am extremely proud of all the things she's accomplished because she, without a doubt, has accomplished more than I could have thought with all the barriers and all the things that she had to jump over, including the pandemic, um, including just time and responsibility and commitment. Um, but I want to thank you all for being there for her and for my family for being there for her. Um, and for giving her this opportunity to grow and become the person who she is. And she she now has a really good platform and foundation to continue to do the things that she wants to do and the things that help other people and help her community. So thank you all. I'm very proud of you. Um, you know, it's hard to communicate that sometimes. I'm very, very proud of you. And you accomplished so much. So with all that, we invite you to join us at the Nartex for some cake, coffee if you like, brownies and all kinds of goodness. And we can continue our stories out there. Uh, we invite you to take a look at Lily's display that she set up, lots of pictures, lots of memories, lots of tears. Uh, but I don't think anybody could sum up any better than what they just said about how proud we are of you. And uh, this is only the beginning, uh, but we're thankful for you as a congregation and as a church family to allow us to be able to, to share this with you today. And uh, Mark, you have some announcements for us to do. Welcome the friends and family and the friends and family of the Palmer family this morning. Believe me, we have joined as a congregation uh, seeing the kids grow up and become a fine young lady and young man that they are today. So we were just as grateful to have you as you were to have us. So we're, we're very, very happy to have you this morning. Um, I'd like to just point out a few things in the bulletin. We have a church council meeting on Tuesday night this coming week, and then all the different things that you might be participating in. Then I'd like to introduce Mike Blank, who is the chair of our SPRC committee. 
he has an announcement for us. Morning, everyone. I do have an important announcement today. Um, and I'll start off by saying that uh, within, uh, I guess within the last two weeks, um, Pastor Stephen approached uh, a few of us in church leadership positions. And then uh, more recently uh, at an SBRC meeting we had this past week. And uh, what he communicated to us was that uh, at this point in time, uh, he feels like he there's a need for him to uh, kind of step back and, and, and take a break. Um, Stephen came to us over three years ago and uh, he's been caring for this congregation over those three years, most of it in COVID. And uh, I think he feels at this time, it's, it's time to step back for a little uh, self-care. Uh, so, um, and self-care is one of the things that uh, uh, the SBRC addresses in our yearly evaluation of our, our pastor. So uh, what this means to us as a congregation here at Ward's Chapel is the following. Um, so Stephen is going to be uh, taking a break from regular duties, um, and this will start uh, this week, and uh, it will cover a, uh, a six-week period and that will include the next uh, five uh, Sundays. Now, uh, what that means is Stephen will not be attending regular church functions or church meetings. Uh, however, I would like to emphasize that Stephen uh, is going to be available to uh, feel any emergencies that arise during that uh, six week period. He will be home. Um, except for maybe a couple of days you're taking lawn to college. I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh, he will be uh, in the area and uh, he can address anything that's really uh, important that comes up in the, in the congregation. So uh, in terms of the uh, Sunday services, um, the next two Sundays, uh, August 14th and August 21st, the Sunday services will be conducted here by uh, uh, Pastor Don Bergard, who uh, I think many of you know from, uh, he was our pastor here for 11 years, uh, I guess late 90s to early 2000s, I believe. So uh, it'll give us a chance to get reacquainted with him for the next two Sundays. And then um, I believe Pastor Steve, Stephen has someone, another pastor, I, I don't remember the name, Hi, David, Dave Highfield, who will cover uh, another one of the Sundays. So uh, I think at this time we need to establish coverage for the other two Sundays. And uh, the last I spoke to you, I think we're, um, that's still pending, uh, how we cover the other two Sundays. So, uh, so anyway, um, Stephen will be going through uh, a period where, well, maybe he'll just uh, kind of be able to step back, take a break. I mean, not totally. He still has a son to get to college. He still has a, a move pending to the parsonage at Glendon, so uh, he'll be busy. But uh, at the end of the six-week period, hopefully uh, he'll come back to us with uh, you know fresh perspectives. Uh, fresh ideas and uh, maybe a re reinvigoration. And uh, I think uh, as a congregation, we will certainly see the benefit of that. Um, I'll, it's my intention to touch base with Stephen over this uh, six week period, maybe every week or 10 days or so, just touch base and see how things are going and uh, communicate anything to him that uh, we feel should be communicated. Um, so we have church council meeting this Tuesday. Any more uh, issues, concerns that uh, we have as a congregation to be addressed there by church leadership? So um, anyway, uh, please let us know if you have any particular questions, issues, and uh, concerns. Uh, direct them to somebody who can field those at uh, church council. So 
So that's it. We wish you well, Stephen, in the next six weeks. And um, we hope it's a benefit to you and all of us, ultimately, as a congregation here for staff. Um, any other announcements? Um, or do you have anything else? Oh. Uh, she will go more than this week. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, if there's anybody else uh, that would like to come out, it will be Thursday at uh, 10 a.m. at the Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Be my seat. Everybody will be called out on Thursday at 10 a.m. You can check the and the clarity for uh, Yeah, this is fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyone else? I guess uh, we'll turn to the North next and uh, continue our fellowship out there. Thank you.